Conductor Pro, real-time animation. Conductor Pro is a popular tool for creating real-time animation of analog, digital, and electronically animated figures. This can be done both online, frame by frame, and offline to create the perfect show profile data. This tutorial explores the real-time recording process using joysticks, keyboards, USB human interface devices, and MIDI consoles to rehearse and record timeline data. Recording groups, input presets, and data management are covered in this intermediate tutorial. It is assumed that all basics and layout videos have been viewed, as well as Vagal device configuration tutorials for those users using directly connected animation and programming hardware. In this example, we have a Pro Commander set up on IP address 10.0.0.101 and port 55.55. Underneath this, we have two groups, one for analog and one for digital, which contains our digital and analog outputs. These groups are not entirely necessary, however, for the purpose of this video, they will help us to expedite our import and export procedures. To get started, we want to globally define our input controllers. On the Input Controller tab, we'll see anything connected to our computer that would allow live control or recordable playback within Conductor. The first thing I'll want to do is set up my analog devices for the Logitech joystick. I'll click to highlight and drag my x-axis and my y-axis over into this range. Immediately, I can grab the joystick and move left and right and up and down to see those move in real time. I'm also going to label these left, right, as well as up, down. Within here, I can also define a range of response or invert that value globally for recording and live control. Again, this is my analog setup and does not include any of my inputs on the joystick trigger uh, buttons or on the keyboard itself. I do want to add buttons one and two just for the purpose of punching in and punching out. And I'll go ahead and label these up top as punch in Again, wide open range, and punch out. This gives me the ability to just press the joystick trigger, as you can hear in the background, to punch into my recording, which we'll set up later in recording groups down here. I do want some keyboard inputs that will also allow me to record in real time my animation for my digital outputs. Once I've defined these, I can see them actually show up here, just like I had with my joystick and also my punch in punch out and I can save these as a controller configuration which again is repeatable and global inside conductor or load the another configuration or this previous configuration at a later date <clears throat> into any project on any machine. I can also save the current configuration as a default that will be loaded on conductor startup regardless of the HFX project you are using. This is very powerful because it gives an individual user the ability to define inputs and recording groups specific to that machine and portable by individual file, thus preventing individual setup after a project is open for a new user. Once this is set up, we are done in the input groups or the input controller setup and will now be setting up the, in, or the recording group. To set up the recording group, I go to the configuration tab, which is here vertically, and select the Create New Group or Control N. Inside of a recording group, I can have multiple recording groups within a single file, and each of these recording groups can be punched in or punched out of globally or individually. In this case, I'll do my digital group as well as my analog group. As you may have guessed, I'll set up my analogs to be the joystick and the analog outputs. Under device, I'm gonna pick the Logitech Extreme 3D. I'll do my left and right, and I'll go back to my analog figure and choose head left right, dragging and dropping this from my layout panel to my recording target channel. You will notice as I do this, Conductor Pro will prompt you for any properties that are missing. If I set this up again and do up down, and roll over this, each time a parameter is set, it will tell me what is left to do. So in this case, I'll go to up down, and of course that completes. Important to note here is that we can set a punch in and punch out specific move, ease in and out value. 
This means as we're recording and punching in and out to existing show data, these ease in and out times will help manage our data to prevent jerks in the actual recording. The last thing I like to do, which is completely optional, is to define a punch in and punch out, generally a digital property from the joystick. So I've assigned punch in as the trigger and allowed myself to punch, punch in on that particular value. Punch in and out can be the same value or same input, giving you a uh, button for punch in and punch out of that specific group. So if I do the punch in button, I can also assign that to punch out as well. Now when I'm back over here, punch in and punch out, even though they are the same button, is toggling that recording group. We will come back to that in just a moment. If your controller has force feedback or live playback tracking, such as a Mackie MCU Pro, that will show up here as an extendable option. As well, you can clone the item or remove the item at any time. Should you want to change this on the fly, dragging an additional move or a new move over the property will replace it as you would expect. So I have one group set up here that I can see the analog in, uh, inputs actually corresponding to these bars. That's for the left and right and up and down. However, if I were to roll the timeline, you'll notice I can move this and nothing is actually happening. In order to get the actual recording to lay down on the timeline, I need to be in recording mode and I need to be punched in either globally, which is all groups in this panel, or individually by recording group. In this case, I'll roll the timeline, press my trigger, which is the uh, joystick trigger button, and start moving this in and out and up and down to get my recorded data in the timeline. Once I'm finished, I can press that trigger again, and that time data is stamped into the Conductor Pro timeline, and the recording is punched out. Now, immediately, I can drag the cursor back watch my playback and punch in to record over the data assets here. In this case, I'm going to stop the timeline before I punch out. This gives me the ability to review the data that I have where the gray data is previous data and the red data is what I've newly recorded. Once I punch out, that data is applied and saved to the timeline. Should I not want it, I could undo any of these recording points in time and step back a single level. In this case, I do decide I want to go back to what I originally had and I go back to the previous take. Let's go back to the configuration window because I do want to add some digital outputs as well. I decided I really like my Logitech Extreme, so I want to use the punch in button to record and what do I want to record? I actually want to record the eye blink. So again, this is, this is sort of why under input controllers, we don't want to get too specific because as we're going through this on the fly, uh, we may want to uh, change things or modify them uh, as we actually are into our recording. In this case, uh, I'm going to leave the punch out, or sorry, the punch in uh, undefined because I'm going to use the global punch in here. Now note that if I punch in down here, both groups are active and both my digital group, which is this, and my punch in and punch out are gonna be utilizing the same thing. That gets a little tricky, so I don't wanna do that. I'm gonna go back, actually all the way up to my, uh, my input setup. I wanna grab a different input from the joystick. Uh, let's do button number 10, and let's find button 10 on the joystick. Okay, I have that and I will just simply change this to button 10, and now I have that ability to record. So if I wanna add a button, just simply in the middle of this, I go to input controllers, and then that's immediately available down here uh, under my recording. So now I have that independent trigger for the digital eye blink. I don't have a punch in here, and I don't think I actually want one, because I can just deselect this analog group and have the ability of punching in and punching out with this button or the timeline control, which we'll look at momentarily. So I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna press my global punch in with only digital selected, and you'll see here that I'm actually recording the eye blink movement as such. Now if I stop my timeline, once again, that data's sort of there in limbo, and I punch out to actually apply it. Another thing that we can do is do a global punch in based on marker. Here, 
I'll mark this punch in and change my action to punch in. And I'll make M5, punch out, and change the action to punch out. Now, when my timeline is running, anything that's actually in the default group here for recording, that is anything that is checked, will punch in and punch out corresponding to this checkbox right here. Of course, if I had both groups selected, it would have erased over my other analog data. So I did not want to do that. Of course, these markers can also be moved in and out and allow you to punch in and punch out as a rolling range while you actually record in the timeline. Another unique feature that we can use is actually the rehearsal mode, which allows yet another layer of testing and adjusting over the live recording data that exists. So if I roll this timeline, the punch in actually applies. And you'll notice here that I get blue data for the punch in and punch out. What that allows me to do is compare the data that I have puppeteer live or program live on the fly without actually changing my individual data. Now, please note there is no way to save this data. This is just sort of a scratch pad for your animation that you can compare the previous data with something you created on the fly prior to actually recording that data in the timeline. Finally, one feature that you can use to help automate your recording procedure is the temporary range setting using these red and yellow markers. By default, when I stop and start the timeline using the space bar or the shortcut key of my choice, I just have a simple ability to stop, start, and play this range. However, you'll notice I'm starting to set myself up here for a beginning, which is this red mark. Now where I'm at in the timeline, if I were to press Alt Space, I defined an endpoint marker. Once I have a beginning and endpoint marker, I can set up a temporary range of either locked or moving and releasable parameters for the beginning and end of my play range. Why this is nice is as my timeline is running, I can at any time hit control space and jump back to the beginning. So again, control space goes back to the beginning. Alt space helps me define my end range. So now using alt space, I have an end which will stop us where we're at and take us back to the beginning of that section. Should you want to loop that section, you can simply left click on the stop icon and you'll notice it's now a play icon which will loop from the end point to the beginning point over and over again until of course this is stopped or that range is cleared. Now the next time I press space and space again, that range is cleared and it gives me the ability to create a new loop. Of course, you can also drag these at any point or you can right click to make them permanent. So once those are shaded, those are permanent and cannot be moved if you know you have a repeatable range for a long period of time. Between this and the punch in and punch out range, you have a very powerful rapid access to play range and recording range independently and on the fly in your timeline. This concludes the recording setup for basic Conductor Pro functions using multiple recording groups, rehearsal mood, modes, recording modes, punch it and punch out, and on the fly definable range settings. Once we have our recording data established and we're relatively happy with it, the next thing we probably are gonna to wanna to do is actually edit this data offline to truly make it as perfect as possible. This may depend on your show and the complexity of the actual animations involved, but generally there is some deleting or adding that you would wanna do that would be near impossible with live controls. Let's start with digital first because those are generally easier to construct. Depending on my keyboard definition shortcuts, I can either zoom in using these buttons or the plus minus key or whatever I had decided would be good for my recording. Again, digital being the simplest in nature, we can click on the track and have a lot of options available to us immediately. You'll see some points that are quickly available for you to grab. So for example, if I were to grab this, I could turn this movement off or on, I could stretch it, I could move it closer or further to the previous point. But more, more than not, with digital outputs and animation, you would actually drag and click over the area that you wanted to edit and use one of my tools up here to either cut, copy, paste, or delete those existing points. If I want to create some simple digital animations, I can start rapidly clicking my start points and my end points, and those get put back into Conductor quite simply. 
I can grab the endpoint to delay or extend the duration of the digital output. Again, beginning or end can be adjusted here simply. Or if I know I want longer range, I can copy and paste within that original timeline. Now here, if I want to copy this entire range, I can copy that, delete it, shift the whole thing back, and hit paste to get the same thing repeated. Again, digital animation is relatively simple. However, there are most options available here directly from the timeline. There is no external window or any other editing procedure that is required here. Analog is where things get a little more complicated. As you can see, the Logitech joystick does a pretty good job of getting us points in here that are relatively smooth. However, if I want to start editing these either independently or in sync, a lot of care needs to be taken in how I actually select and manipulate these points. By default, I can click and drag over a specific section and move this in sync, either left or right before I hit my next point, or up and down to scale these points together. While I'm doing this, either for both digital or analog, I can temporarily lock the movement of points horizontally by pressing the H key or this icon, or I can temporarily lock the movement of the points vertically. This allows me to adjust the range without adjusting the time, or allows me to adjust the time without adjusting the range. This can be particularly helpful when I have a larger group of points selected and I don't want to move their relation in time, but perhaps the move is too high or too low. Additionally, if I want to optimize this curve so that I have the least amount of points possible, I can highlight a selection, right click, go down to points, then optimize curve, to find a loss quotient, whether it's the selection or not, whether to preserve the horizontals or not, and hit apply, you'll notice that Conductor has reduced the amount of data points to the minimum possible. While this isn't necessary in most shows, it can provide a little bit of smoothness where you don't have additional data fighting itself for the actual position. Also on large shows, it is recommended that you optimize all data to prevent any overflow. Other moves available from this right-click menu include deleting all points, which is also replicated with this red X, creating points at a current times, inverting the value, which I will show you momentarily, scaling the time, shifting the time, changing the interpolation from linear to step or curve. This is important, especially for import legacy data. You can scale the values or again, optimize the curve. Let's take a look at invert because this is pretty easy to tell. Once I hit invert, what was now low is now high and what is, was, was previously high is now low. Here you'll also notice that Conductor does tween the data for the points that were selected with what is already existing. Not to be overlooked is the fact that we can grab individual points and move those around without a particular range selection. Please note here that the wall you're seeing is actually the previous point which you cannot exceed when you are editing. Same thing with the forward point. So you have this range for adjustment. If this is not precise enough for a specific point, you could either enter the percentage value or the value within the range of the channel. By default in Conductor, the range is 16-bit or 65,000 FF. In this case, it is 16-bit, but for DMX or other movements, it may be 8 or 12. We could also change the type of interpolation from either linear, step, or curve, step being mostly for digital, but for this, we can do either curve or linear. In this case, the curve gives me a little bit more of a range that I can actually play with as I edit my points. If I can't get the point at the exact moment in time where I want with my mouse, I can also go over here and type in that numerical value. However, as you saw here in this case, that actually exceeded that point range, so it moved and created a new point at a later point in time. So be careful on how you use this movement, but please note that it can be used uh, to either move the locator to that spe specific position, uh, create a marker, or move a point inside or outside of a programmable range. Some other unique features. Let's clear out the data here. I'll do that by selecting and hitting the range. Is the pencil tool. This is called freehand drawing mode and is best suited for tablet use such as a Surface Pro. However, you can use a mouse for this to draw out your curve from the last point to the next point. 
By doing this, I can simply draw this curved data as I'd want it. And Conductor Pro will put in the minimum number of points required to achieve this particular data set. What's also handy is let's say I wanted to connect these two dots without actually editing or deleting all these individual points. I can do what I call a strike through line from point A to point B, and that curve is optimized and tweened on the fly for again, the least amount of data points required for that animation. Again, that is the freehand pencil tool and is activated either with this icon or the F key on your keyboard. Next to this, I have the smudge tool and which activates the smudge tool radius. This is very similar to other programs that you may have seen where I can just kind of freeform and drag a group of points around on the fly. Depending on the size of my range, I can adjust many or few. And of course, the more complex the animation, the more powerful this tool is. Not only does it go up and down, but it can also be used to slide a group of points proportionately forward or backwards in the timeline. This is a smudge tool and again is available mostly for analog data using the S key or this icon. We won't go through all the icons here because there are quite a few options for analog editing. However, some basic things are aligning points to previous or next points, selecting all points right or left of an indicator, selecting the next point in line, the previous point in line, or creating a point at the position of the marker. All of these can be used again during the real time playback uh, animation without going to a external window. Another feature for a lot of specific computers, particularly tablets that can be very effective is the select range bounding box. If I were to select a range with my left click and drag and then right click before actually releasing it, which uh, I don't have a right click on this particular mouse, uh, I would be able to select a bounding box. If you have a similar issue to me where you cannot actually left click and drag while independently right clicking, we do offer a shortcut box up here, which is toggle selection mode. In this case, I can do that after I've selected my range or at any point uh, that this box is active. So I can move that uh, once it's selected, what I have the ability to do is actually more similar to our pin group than it is our track editing. The pin group we'll get to in just a moment, but here with that bounding box selected, I'm able to move anything in that box, either left and right, or again, up and down, scaling that data, stretching that data, or moving it in time. We'll go over, over the pin groups a little bit more in just a moment, but know that this bounding box can help you if you have tablet editing ability or if your mouse does not have independent left click or right click. Particularly if you are running this in a virtual machine, we would recommend editing groups of points using this box over just doing the independent point capture. As far as analog goes, again, we can lock vertical and horizontal, freeform draw, smudge tool, or independent point edit, as well as do the standard optimization curves that you may be used to invert values, scale time, shift time, change interpolation, scale values, or optimize curves. However, one thing that comes up a lot is the ability to edit points or the requirement to edit points in synchronization with other tracks. This could be an audio track or it could be other animation data. What we have set up for that in Conductor is what's called a pin group. And in this case, I wanna pin the head up and down with the head left and right so that I can edit those groups in a selectable but codependent range between the two channels. So I'll pin this and I'll pin this. Now notice that I'm not going again into a separate interface, but I'm staying right here in the track and just pinning this particular data to the top of the timeline. Some people use the pin group just to keep it at the top. This could be for an audio track or a video track. Uh, but in general, we, we tend to use it for editing of moves that need to be codependent. Uh, once we're finished, these will just go back in the timeline. They're just temporarily uh, kind of diverted for our editing needs. So I'm actually going to shrink this up for real estate reasons so I can see things a little bit better. And then I'm going to click on this toggle group zoning mode. When I select this mode, this gives me the ability to create a macro range around a multiple set of channel or multiple sets of channels. Uh, if I click a left point here, and then followed by a right point, I now have what's called the zoning range. 
If I just click and drag this, similar to what we saw previously, I can move any of these points in lockstep forward or backwards and have the tracks automatically tween the previous and afterthought data. So if I let go, I'm moving this forward and backwards in time, and again, that data is adjusting as discussed. If I want to actually replicate this data, I can hold down the control key, and you'll notice that my data actually turns to red. And so if I were to kind of overlap this, like I want to align it and do almost a repeating loop, uh, I have that ability either forward or backwards, and that gives me the ability to sort of line that up without actually having to manually copy and paste, try to line it up, um, and then get everything, of course, tweened appropriately. Um, other things we can do is set this range by clicking the left and right after we've established it, as well as, as define uh, the selectable endpoints that are required here. Other things in the pin group are creating a pin group from the items that are all currently pinned. Um, what that means is down here in the layout, we can create something that is sort of a lasting effect or descend the default value, the minimum value or the maximum value for all channels. This can be particularly useful for homing in analog electric animation where a group of functions needs to be forced to a value prior to sending a homing command. Whatever those parameters were for minimum, maximum, and default, those will be sent based on the pin group default value when it is sent from here. Once I'm finished, I unpin all items and I return to normal track data. This concludes this video on live recording, input controller setup, recording group setup, and offline editing for analog and digital movements.